You're watching Africa Speaks and today being World Refugee Day or Africa Refugee Day, uh, June the 20th, we are honored to be speaking to the UNHCR country rep for Kenya, Rauf Mazu, who is here to tell us more about the current status of refugees in Kenya and across board. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Well, uh, what is the focus for 2015? Uh, the focus for 2015 uh, uh, here in Kenya is to continue to respond to the emergencies that we are that we're facing. Uh, last year, we had, uh, as a result of the crisis in South Sudan, we had a, a large number of South Sudanese who came, close to 50,000. This this number has now has now reduced. But we're also trying to look at solutions. Uh, there are. Uh, a large number of uh, Somali refugees uh, here in the here in the country, uh, 380,000 in Dadaab only. So one of the focus is also solutions. What can we do to find a solution to that crisis? Right. Um, recently, the deputy president gave an order to relocate Dadaab camp back to Somalia. And, uh, you know, of course, a lot of people criticized the move, but also a lot of people were in support of it, saying that, you know, it's high time we took care of our own uh, before, you know, more people are killed. But what exactly has happened since that day? Since that day, a number of things have happened. The first, when you say that, uh, that uh, people are saying that uh, there are too many refugees and they've been here for, for too long, the mm -hmm. reality is that uh, we've, there's been uh, here in Kenya uh, Somali refugees since the crisis started in this country. That's 25 years. Um, uh, and as I said, there are a large number of refugees in the country. What they all dream about is to go back to their country. So everybody is hoping that one day they will be able to, to, to return. So the, to have that situation lasting for such a long time is not something anybody is in, is in favor of. Uh, what has happened since then? Uh, the deputy president had a meeting on the 20th of April, if I'm not mistaken, with uh, the Prime Minister of Somalia. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they both discussed the situation uh, of Somalis, the situation in Somalia, but also the situation of Somali refugees. And they agreed that uh, they would uh, continue to implement an agreement that uh, we signed in uh, November 2013 a tripartite agreement for the return of Somali refugees, which we signed in, uh, in, in, in November 2013. And that agreement uh, stresses that the return has to be voluntary. Mm -hmm. and, and there was a general agreement on that. The following day, on the 21st of April, we had a meeting uh, which was chaired by the Cabinet Secretary for Foreign Affairs of Kenya. The Minister of Foreign Affairs from uh, Somalia was also there. I was present for UNHCR and we agreed that we would continue to implement the tripartite agreement that has to be that has been signed. Right. But uh, when he gave the order, he actually even gave an ultimatum. You know, he said within the next uh, these many days, uh, we shouldn't see any Somali refugees in Somalia. But, you know, looking at the issue and critically analyzing it, was this a right move? And is it even possible to relocate this camp? Uh, the, in terms of was it a right move or not, it's uh, a statement which was made by, by, by the Deputy President. Uh, um, and as I said, that statement was the expression of a level of frustration that, as I said before, can be understood, and not just by the Kenyans, by the Somalis themselves. Uh, a, a Somali who has been in uh, Dadaab for, uh, since the 90s uh, uh, would like to be able to go back home. What we have to realize is that uh, today you have more than 6,000 uh, uh, kids, children, whose parents were born in Dada. So you actually have a second generation of people who are born in Dada. Is that tolerable? Is that an acceptable situation? Definitely not. So everything has to be done for refugees to be able to go back to their places of origin. Now, Inside Somalia, you have a situation that varies depending on where you are. Mm -hmm. There are parts of Somalia which are safe, and there are parts of Somalia which are not yet safe. And in parts of Somalia that are safe, uh, you don't uh, have, in all these, uh, these, these areas, you don't have uh, 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 access to basic services for everybody. Basic services, education, healthcare, and the rest. So this is what we have to focus on, and this is what the international community has to focus on. For places, parts of Somalia where there is security, we should do everything possible 
for basic services to be, av to be available for those who would like to, to return. All right. Um, you, you, there's something that uh, was mentioned by the Cabinet Secretary for Interior, and uh, he said that uh, at the point, at this point, there are some uh, cases of insecurity that have been reported in the Dadaab camp, and this brings into mind uh, the fact that Doctors Without Borders evacuated, I think, 40 of their staff. Mm -hmm. uh, that was, I think, three weeks ago. About yes. Yes, and and they were citing insecurity. But what do you have to say about a situation like? that knowing that uh, UNHCR uh, has to take care of these refugees and ensure that you know no cases such as insecurity are arising in the camp mm. the, uh, the, the the first thing I would say is that the uh, responsibility for security throughout Kenya is a sovereign responsibility of the government uh, and, and, and that has to be stressed so mm -hmm. for any part of Somalia and a camp a refugee camp of, of Kenya and a camp in a refugee camp um, is not uh, immune uh, of that. Uh, you, uh, the responsibility for security remains that of the government. So what we have done and what we are doing as UNHCR is to provide support mm -hmm. to the government mm -hmm. because we do realize that providing security uh, to a place which, as I said before, has uh, 350,000 uh, refugees uh, about 80 kilometers away from the border uh, as I said before, there are parts of Somalia uh, which are peaceful, but there are parts of Somalia which are not peaceful. Uh, KDF is present in Somalia as part of the of the Amisom. Mm -hmm. So Somalia is a, is a, is a place where the, the, uh, parts of which there are, there is insecurity. So taking that into consideration, the security in Dadaab requires special attention. That special attention is provided by the government. There are, uh, there is a large number of uh, police and security forces in Dadaab, mm -hmm. and we are providing support to the government in order for security to be uh, provided. All right. And how would you evaluate the repatriation program of Somalis who are currently in Kenya? Um, yes, I know you did mention that it's supposed to be voluntary, but are they willing to go back or are they in between, you know, what if we go back and then insecurity comes up again and then we have to come back? What exactly uh, would be your evaluation of the process? What we've observed, uh, looking at last year, um, and when we checked in the figures and the number of refugees in the camp, we realized that uh, there had been a reduction of about 50,000 people. So there are about 50,000 Somalis who left the camp uh, last year. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of them left the camp to go back to, uh, to Somalia, two parts of the country, as I said before, which they consider as, as safe. What you have to, to take into consideration is the fact that many of the refugees who are in Dadaab left uh, their country in 2011, 2012, at the time of the drought and the famine. And many of them consider now that they're in a position of, of, of returning. So what I would say when you ask me to evaluate the, the, the return, I would say that we've seen a sizable spontaneous return, a return of people who went back on their own without asking anything from us. And we have also since uh, December last year started a pilot project. We were initially focusing on three areas, Luke, Paidoa, and Kismayo. So we're basically supporting and providing assistance to refugees originating from these three areas. Mm -hmm. um, and we have, as a result of this, uh, supported more than 2,000 people who have returned. We have now re-evaluated the situation inside Somalia, and we are going to increase the number of areas where, uh, or from where people uh, uh, originate, in that originate. Uh, and we, um, we, we believe that a much larger number of people will return. Part of the areas that we are going to, uh, or, or where people are going back to, which we are going to support, is Mogadishu. Mogadishu is one of the places where a number of refugees uh, in Dadaab originate from. All right. What are some of the challenges that have been experienced by UNHCR in regard to repatriating them uh, back to Somalia or uh, asking them to voluntarily go back home. Are there any challenges you have faced? Um, as you said, it is voluntary. Uh, so what um, uh, we do is to provide information to uh, the Somali refugees on uh, the condition in their places of origin, and we provide them with, with support. The, the main challenge I would say that we have experienced is uh, situations where refugees 
uh, have an interest in going back to their place of origin, but there is no basic services, there is no health care, there is no education in their place of origin. Mm -hmm. So I would say the number one challenge that we are experiencing, not just us, the whole international community, is to make sure that we provide that support in places of return. Um, Somalia is a country which, uh, as we all know, has gone through 25 years of, of civil war. A lot of parts of the country have been destroyed. Reconstruction takes time. Uh, reconstruction is expensive. It requires a significant support from the international community, which we've been trying to, to mobilize and to gather. Um, last month, uh, in, in, in May, our High Commissioner Commissioner Guterres, the, the, the head of uh, UNHCR, came and had meetings with uh, the head of state and a number of other officials. And one of the agreement was that we should call, um, sometimes in September or October, an international conference to mobilize resources for these basic services that I've been talking about earlier, mm -hmm. so to support the return, to make sure that we do have the resources that are required for people to be able to go back to their place of origin, as we say, in safety and dignity, meaning that they will go back and they will be able to reconstruct and rebuild their lives in their places of return. Right. Of um, origin, yeah. Okay. Let's, let's now uh, broaden it outside of Somalia. And the number of refugees in camps has really kept on going up. You know, we are now looking at about 86% uh, this year from 70% uh, in the previous years. Um, who are the most affected lot when it comes to people fleeing their countries of origin for safety? Um, it, it is clearly uh, uh, women and children. These are, they are the, 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 the first victim for various reasons. They are mm -hmm. the first to, to, to try and flee. But on the numbers that you were mentioning, it's true that uh, it is, it, it, since we started recording refugee movements, uh, the number of or forced displacement, because it's not just refugees, but also internally displaced persons, uh, with about close to 60, 000, 60 million uh, refugees and internally displaced persons around the world, we've never had such a, such a number. So and that is a result of, of crisis that we see everywhere. In Africa, it's crisis in Central African Republic, in Mali, in DRC, in South Sudan. Some years ago, it is now uh, resolved, but some years ago in, uh, in, in Côte d'Ivoire, so we've seen a, a, a huge increase in the number of crises, mm -hmm. in number of conflict, and as a result of that, we've seen an increase in the number of forcibly displaced persons. Right. And you did mention women and children are the most affected. Most of them are fleeing war, some are fleeing persecution, and in some cases we've had uh, terror attacks as well that remain the main reason for people fleeing their homes. But what are some of the efforts that are being put in place to ensure calm is restored in these countries? That is, that is the, the, the challenge that uh, many, many countries are, are trying to grapple with. And, and if you look at our continent in particular, um, the, the, the level of violence that you see in a number of countries that, uh, that I've described, uh, there are efforts that are being made by the United Nations, by uh, regional organizations. But, but what we see often, and we all know that, it is conflicts that are fueled by uh, individuals or people who want to have access or cheap access to, to, to natural resources. And they then build on the interest of some to fuel tribalism uh, and, and, and the rest. And as a result of which you have uh, population movements. Mm -hmm. Eastern DRC is probably the, the part of Africa which, have suffered, which has suffered the most from, from, from this. Um, the, the real answer is probably uh, development, which we see in a number of countries, improvement of the condition of living of people, um, more access to employment for, for youth, uh, and, and, and gradually to have uh, more people who, who, who have something to lose, uh, something to lose because they've been able to acquire something. So I would say these are the, the efforts that are being made in some countries, which. Uh, can be a way of, of preventing further uh, uh, forced displacement. All right. Um, there's been the issue as well that has come up regarding asylum seekers. And uh, they say that the status of asylum seekers in most developing countries, which I would say across Africa, mm -hmm. is not exactly recognized. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between a refugee 
and an asylum seeker and what are their entitlements uh, given the fact that a lot of them are categorized as the same? Yeah, the, the, um, an asylum seeker is somebody who has crossed the border, arrived in another country and is, uh, and is then seeking asylum, meaning that he is asking the country uh, which is receiving him or her to recognize him or her as a refugee. So you are registered as an asylum seeker mm -hmm. and then you are given the refugee status. Um, here in Kenya, the difference between an asylum seeker and a refugee in terms of the, the way the person is treated uh, uh, is, is the same. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the, 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 only, the only difference is that you have in one case somebody who has not yet been recognized as a refugee and one which has already been recognized. It's worth saying that um, according to the OEU convention, when you are fleeing a country that is at war, uh, and that is the case of Somalia, that is the case of uh, South Sudan, mm -hmm you are recognized automatically based not on your individual claim of, perse of persecution, but you are recognized on the basis of the situation in the place where, uh, where you came from. So, so that is, is faster. It's faster in the sense that you prove that you are a South Sudanese, you prove that you are a Somali, and then you are uh, recognized as a refugee faster than, than you would if, for instance, you come uh, uh, to, to Kenya from Rwanda or from, uh, what will I say, from Congo, uh, Republic of Congo, from other country. Right. And uh, are there any educational programs that are being provided, say, to the refugees in the different camps that we have, uh, say, Dadaab and Karkuma? Um, and, and if yes, what are some of these programs? Are they educational? Are they uh, programs that would actually help people continue the education that they uh, had when they were fleeing their countries of origin? Indeed, um, and one of the important part of, uh, uh, part of what we're doing, uh, uh, an important part of the assistance we are providing is, is education. There are about 120,000 uh, children involved in primary schools uh, throughout the country, but primarily in Dadaab and, and, and Kakuma, about 8,700 uh, secondary school, and uh, 3,000 or so vocational training, uh, tertiary education, and, and the rest. So these are uh, services and assistance that we are providing to refugees, which, which they value. Uh, and, and when you discuss with a refugee in Kakuma or, or Dadaab and you ask what is the most important thing that you are being provided with, often refugees talk about education because this is what will, as you say, as you said, uh, that's, this is the only thing that will allow you to reconstruct your life while you'll be, when you'll be able to go back to your place of origin mm -hmm. or uh, allow you to find some job and employment in the country where you are. So education is really crucial when you find yourself in a refugee situation, education is crucial. Right. So there have been so many crises across uh, the Eastern African region. We can mention the DRC that has never-ending crises. Mm. Uh, we've had South Sudan as well that even up to today we cannot say is uh, completely stable. Mm -hmm. We have Somalia that continues to suffer as well under terror attacks. But most recently we've had the crisis in Burundi mm -hmm. and a lot of people have been fleeing the country into Rwanda and some of them into Tanzania. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you say would be a solution to Burundi's crisis at the moment? That's probably a very difficult question <laughs> that you're asking me. Um, I think the, 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 if, if one compares the Burundi situation to other crises on the, on the continent, mm -hmm. um, it is the, 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 the answer to some of these crises is democratization, it's democracy, it's inclusion, it's allowing the voice of the people to be, to be, to be heard. Um, it is development, as we were mentioning uh, before. Uh, I think these are the things which, which will help uh, reducing the number of crises we are, we are facing. As you say, indeed, the, the Burundi crisis has seen a, the departure of a large number of people, primarily towards, uh, towards uh, uh, Tanzania. Mm -hmm. There were also a number of Burundi refugees here in, in Kenya. Last year, I think there were about 300 or 400 of them who went back to, to Burundi. So I fear that the, even them will have to find themselves uh, coming back to Kenya or trying to seek refuge uh, uh, elsewhere.
All right. And uh, as we come to an end of this, uh, what going forward, what are some of the strategies that uh, the UNHCR is looking at uh, regarding the welfare of uh, refugees across camps, not just in Kenya, mm -hmm. but as well as Uganda and everything? Mm -hmm. And also how accommodative are African countries, fellow African countries, when it comes to refugees? When it comes to refugees, uh, the continent is, is the one uh, that has the most uh, liberal laws. I mean, it's the only continent which has an international instrument that is very, very liberal and, and, and uh, welcoming of, of refugees. The countries in general are very welcoming. Kenya is the second largest uh, asylum country in Africa immediately after, after Ethiopia. And if you look at African countries in general, they have always been very accommodative, uh, accommodating to, to, to refugees. Um, now, you're asking how are we providing assistance, what, what, what differs? Yes. One thing that we've seen is that the refugee crisis lasts longer and longer. Uh, and the average refugee crisis now lasts 17 years. We were mentioning the Somalis. Somalis have been here in the country for more than 24 years in camps. Mm -hmm. so one of the questions that is being asked is, is the camp the best and only approach to respond to the protection and assistance requirements or needs of refugees? If you take Uganda, for instance, Uganda is a country which uh, has a large number of refugees and has adopted a policy uh, that basically allows refugees to be part of the economy, to contribute to the economy. Uh, they've given them access to land for the time that they are refugees. And we believe that in the end, it also helps refugees first keeping their skills, if they were farmers in their country, um, and also acquire some, some wealth that they can then use at the time when they will be able to go back to their place of origin. So more and more, um, uh, and this is based also on economic studies that are done by the World Bank, by, uh, by, by other actors, but it is more and more felt that it is not good for the country of asylum, that it is not good for the reconstruction of the country of origin, mm -hmm. and it is not good for the refugees themselves, and it's not good for the host population to have a situation where for decades you have individuals staying in a camp and being provided with food assistance, free health care, free education for, for a long period of time. So that's, these are some of the things that, uh, that, that, that the world and that countries are, are thinking about and, and looking at now. Right. And uh, my final question to you would be that there are a lot of refugees who come into the camps, the Dab, Kakuma, and, and all the other camps across, across the continent. And usually, they're not just looking at staying in the camps. Mm -hmm they're looking at being moved, say, to one of the Western countries, mm -hmm. either Canada or the United States or uh, one of the Schengen countries mm -hmm. out there. But is this something that they should be looking forward to instead of looking forward to going back home where they, where they originate? The, I mean, we often say that the, the real uh, true and durable solution is to go back to your country and to, and, and to reintegrate and then be part of the reconstruction of your, of your country. Mm -hmm the options and the opportunities of resettlement in third countries in the western world are very limited if you if you look at the numbers of people who um, were submitted for resettlement here in kenya for instance last year it's probably six thousand so six thousand as compared to five hundred and eighty thousand you see the the, the, the ratio is, is very is very uh, small so it it is an opportunity that is offered to some but to a very small number of refugees. So it's more to try and focus on, as we were mentioning earlier, education, support to refugees while they are in exile, with the perspective of them being able to go back to their country and reconstruct their, their, their country. There are some cases where refugees remain in the country of asylum uh, after many years, but uh, it's a, it's a solution, and you were talking about conflicts earlier on the African continent. Uh, if you have people who are forced uh, to, to leave their, their country, find themselves in another one, um, never go back to that country, and are told just integrate where you were forced to go, it, it, these are things which create other conflicts later on. So it is always important that 
refugees are in a position of going back to their country, reavail themselves of the protection of their country, their nationality and the rest. And then if they decide to go back to the country where they spent a long time, that's something else. But at least that they uh, are allowed to, to go back to, to their country. Wow. Welcome back. This is Africa Speaks. And well, let's just take a look at some of the numbers. And the UNHCR released a global report on the current uh, number of refugees across the world and uh, uh, their theme that is celebrating resilience. And the World at War report uh, did bring out quite a number of significant uh, numbers here. And we're seeing the report that was released on the 18th of June having the highest level of displacement ever recorded. By end of 2014, staggering 59.5 uh, million people had been forcibly displaced worldwide compared to 51.2 million in 2013 and 37.5 million, that is 10 years ago. This is the biggest leap seen in a single year. And uh, some of the reasons as to why people have fled their countries of origin is because of war, uh, conflict and persecution that has forced more people than any other time since the records began uh, to flee their homes and seek refuge and safety elsewhere. And also, uh, if you look at what exactly this means, globally, one in every 122 humans is now a refugee in the world, internally displaced or seeking asylum uh, in one or another country. And if this were the population of a country, uh, this would be the 24th largest country across the world. So 59.5 uh, million people would make up a country like the Democratic Republic of Congo and maybe three quarters of a country like South Africa. And also, in the past five years, at least 15 conflicts have erupted uh, across Africa and uh, have erupted across the world. Eight of them are in Africa. We're looking at countries like Cote d'Ivoire or uh, Ivory Coast, the Central African Republic, Libya, Mali, Northeastern Nigeria, the Democratic Republic of Congo, South Sudan, and most recently, we're looking at Burundi. And uh, Africa's numerous conflicts as well, including the Central African Republic and those uh, Somalia, as well as the other countries I did mention, produced immense uh, forced displacements that was in the year 2014 on a scale of marginally lower than that of the Middle East. And in all, Sub-Saharan Africa saw 3.7 million refugees and 11.4 million internally displaced people, 4.5 million of whom were newly displaced in 2014. Now, the 17% overall increase excludes Nigeria as a methodology for counting internally displaced uh, changed in 2014, and it could be reliably calculated. Ethiopia re uh, replaced Kenya as the largest refugee hosting country in Africa and the fifth largest worldwide. So we're looking at huge numbers uh, as, as, as huge as 685,000 refugees that is in uh, Ethiopia and then also second in that position is Kenya with about 380,000 in Dadaab camp and 175,000 in Kakuma camp. So well those are the numbers right there and we've come to the end of the show. But I would like to leave you with a clip from uh, Zimbabwe's president and also the African Union chair that is Robert Mugabe who actually slammed the Burundi president for staying in power. But who is speaking? Robert Mugabe is a president who has led Zimbabwe since 1980. Nkurunziza, on the other hand, has led Burundi since 2005. So who should be slamming the other? Take a look at what he said. But when we have served two terms, ah, we have not done much. And two terms was like two weeks. <laughs> so we want to go more. So you want another another term, and you must find an excuse. Uh, the 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 first term I served, oh no, it was not a real term. <laughs> but you were there for five years. <laughs> oh no, uh, it was Parliament which which chose me. I should have been chosen by the people, so that one does not count. <laughs> and the others say it counts. 
And guess what? There are many other African leaders who are looking forward to exceeding their terms. Uh, just recently, we saw the same thing happen in Rwanda, where the RPF party say they were petitioning to have Paul Kagame run for a third term. And Kurunziza of Burundi is seeking a third term as well. President Museveni next year might be seeking a term uh, that is in Uganda. So, yeah, I guess it's, it's, it's more like the African bag. My name is Joy Doreen Bira. Thank you for watching Africa Speaks. Until next weekend, God bless you all.